What's up, y'all? This is your girl, Rosita, a.k.a. Miss Sip with Sip On Radio and Living Your Dreams with Rosita Reality Show. And today I am coming to you live because I am going to interview that Chico Sanchez, a.k.a. Lenore from 3-6 Mafia. I think you have to extend it. It says adding. Hey, there we go. Hey. Now we got full action. Exactly. Hey, there you go. How are you? Um, great. How you doing? I'm doing great. Okay. So I didn't know your name was Chico Sanchez. You know, I was looking for Harris. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know how some of the superstars they get so big, like CeeLo, he called himself, I think Balls Gnarly. I think got the after so long puppy. P. Diddy started calling himself Puffy, or Puffy started calling himself P. Diddy, so I like Chico Sanchez. A close friend gave me that name, so I just use it. Okay, so what is your actual name that your mom gave you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say it? You hear me? Uh-uh. Uh, Derek, Derek Harris. Derek Harris? Yeah, Derek, somebody, but yeah, Derek Harris. Okay. Okay, let me write that down, Derek Harris, because I knew you was a Harris, you know, and like I said, yeah, we did yeah. the uh, research and stuff, found out we related, because you know I'm related to all the Harris over there in Memphis, Tennessee, so. <laughs> yeah, ain't no doubt, you know, it could be, you know, ain't no telling, you know how Memphis made. Exactly, exactly. So, I want to ask you, uh, you're originally from Memphis, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, born and raised. I was born and raised in Bing Hampton, a little neighborhood. Like I think it's like North East Memphis, a little tough spot, but it, it, we we made it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how many siblings do you have? Uh, I got a sister. That's who actually was buzzing in when I when I paused for a minute. I got one sister. We like twelve years apart. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's a big old age difference right there. But she's like my best friend. You know what I'm saying? We talk That's all good. the time. That's good. And I know you have two girls. And I got three girls. Actually, got I got I got girls? twins, and I got a girl named Derrica. Oh, so you know, Tony Booney like my uh, she the oldest, but the twins they're like uh, they're like a month younger than her. They oh. all thirteen though. Okay, okay. So how did you get started in the industry? What made you? This is the testimonial part right here. I want people to hear your testimonial, what you went through. And what made you decide to do what you're doing? I had a big cousin that was a knockout king. Uh, he, mm -hmm. was, he was young. He was not grown men out. And he used to write raps all the time. And, you know, I, ne I didn't have a big brother. So my big cousin was like my big brother. So whatever he did, I would do. So he would write these raps. And I would watch him write the raps. And he would write them like an essay. You know, I never seen a person write a rap like an essay. You know, one, two, three. It came out. It was so perfect. And I was like... Yeah. He was good at it, plus he could write it. You know what I'm saying? That was just appealing to me. So when I got ready to do it, I didn't necessarily take the same approach as him. Uh, you couldn't even understand my raps. I don't care who you were. You probably couldn't understand. I had it because it's just like Eminem. It was, it was like chicken scratch everywhere. Mm. Okay. Like So that's kind of how I got into it. From that point on, my neighborhood kind of got behind me. They didn't even know I could rap. I just bust out rapping one day, and they looked around like, the fuck? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and from that point on, I just I just kept rapping because I had never got that kind of response. You know, I wasn't a ball player. I wouldn't. Uh, I didn't have all the girls. Uh, I came up in a crack era, you know what I mean? So it was like, it was kind of hard. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know, it was so much money around and stuff like this. Things were so different that there was one thing I could hold on to you know what I'm saying? It didn't it didn't ask much of me, but it gave me everything. Okay. So did you ever get involved in the street thing that you know? Yeah, I got involved in I got involved in the streets bad. When I was young, uh when I first started rapping three six mafia, I was in the streets bad. I had a lot of influences around me, a lot of guys that, you know, they had a lot of money. You know, a lot of money. Like in, in the sixth grade, I was in the seventh grade, my cub was in the sixth grade, and he showed me a thousand dollars. And I'm, what the fuck you doing a thousand dollars in the, like, you know, the sixth grade? Yeah. He showed me crack. And I was like, that got you a thousand dollars. 
So it wouldn't it wasn't a question about what I was gonna do next. Jewelry, the girls, the houses, the it, it just was too much. It was too much. And I got it early. So since I got it early, I, I ended up actually snow cocaine at an early age. Mm. You know. And that was that was that was that was that was a real scary period. Uh, Eric Gale, they used to play the good top of uh, uh, Arsenio Hall. I got high with him one night. He got me high one night. Me and Juicy J here introduced us together. And that was the scariest, uh, that was the scariest shit of my whole life. <laughs> but that's how I, I kind of got introduced into fame, mixed into the streets, mixed into, you know, just adolescent, not just life, everything coming at one time. And I was just too young to really understand like I had a great responsibility, you know. I had a whole neighborhood that would follow me, go anywhere I go, do anything I wanted them to do. So I didn't necessarily think like, okay, let's do something with this, build a market with this, let's let's uh, let's build an empire. I didn't think like that. Yeah. None of us thought like that at that age. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how did you get off of the the drugs and stuff? Say it again. How did you get off the drugs? You said that that was the first time that you tried. Oh no, well, I'm a, I, I got a real easy answer for that one. When I first went to prison, when I first went to jail, my mother was on her deathbed and they was offering me, my first offer was a life sentence. Mm -hmm. So that's it. No no magic, no, no nothing, nothing magical at all. Just either she finna die or you finna lose your life. So it was kind of a cut clean and dry decision. Okay. Okay, so tell me about some of the songs that you've written uh, with the 3-6 Mafia. Okay. Now, the, the, the first song I did with Juicy was like, uh, Break Yourself. And that was my first... Uh, that was my first... Uh, um, I'm back. Yeah, huh? I should be back. Right yeah, you yeah I'm waiting for Okay, yeah, that was my first uh, introduction and to like what you like and what people like. That's what I mean by that. I did a song on the spot car riding in the Chevy. I wrote it right there on the spot, right? Mm -hmm. And I never did look for that song to be the song. Yeah. But when this when the tape came out, that was the song that everybody latched onto, riding in the Chevy. So I'm constantly trying to force people to listen to the other one, but they just don't want to hear it. Yeah. And that's when I first realized it's not necessarily what you like. And, and that was one thing that just kind of like, okay, I kind of let Juicy do his thing and I let the people do their thing and I just stayed in my lane. But after that, we did uh, Chronicles of the Juice Man. We did uh, Late Last Night and we did Killer Clan. Killer Clan was one of the funnest when I did because we recorded at the uh, Memphis State, at the girls' dorm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Memphis and the girls, I had never been like, <laughs> I had never been to a, a college, let alone a, a girl's dorm. So um, um, when we, it was kind of hard for me to focus on it because like I said, I never had been into a college before. So, so you were focused on the girls. So you was focused yeah, on the I girls never, instead of trying to get yeah, I never, I was, it was everywhere. They was in and out the room. And I was like, how did he get up here? What did he do? Who do he know? I think the girl he was dating at the time, father was like a judge or something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, Man, whoever you know, I'm glad you know him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, so that's kind of how we... But actually, when he met me, when I when he actually met me rapping, I was down on Bill Street with my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I'm from a very rowdy neighborhood. And my neighborhood was demanding to get in the club for a certain fee. Cause I think he wanted like ten dollars per head, and my homeboy was like, "Get three hundred of us. We're not finna give you ten dollars a head. You finna give us a deal." Exactly. So he was like, "He not. He was right." So they was rattling with him and my cousin said, "Okay, you know, fuck the deal. Listen to my little cousin rap, rap, cuz. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> like that. <laughs> nice. And that's how I met Juicy J. Just like that. Somebody pushed me in my back. Literally pushed me in my back and said, "Rap." Nice. And see, that's what I be trying to tell people. When somebody is telling you to do something, to step out, you never know who's going to hear you. You never know who you're talking to or dealing with right there at that moment or who's and around. He changed my life. 
Yeah. He called me inside the club and made me rap over. He said, now do the same thing you did out there <laughs> over in here to me. Do it again. Exactly. So when I did it, I think he picked me up the very next day. From that point on, uh, we was kind of like friends. We never did have like just a, a recording relationship. We never had a relationship like that. He would always come get me from my mom's house where I go to his mom's house. My mom used to fuss at me because she wanted me to dress more like him because he dressed conservative a lot, you know, but he, he still wore the, the latest mm -hmm. brands now. He still wore what everybody else was wearing. He yeah. just may have tucked his shirt in. You know, he still wore the, the polo boots. He just may have worn them a little different, but he still, he the only somebody I know that would buy a pair of pants or a shirt every day. Now, now when I say that, I mean like this is during the Goldsmith, J.C. Penn, and Dev Dillers era, so we... I'm kind of old, so you kind of, you know, guys paid top dollar for those shirts. If it was a yeah. $70 or $80 shirt, that's what you got. If the yeah. fans was $120, that's what he got. And he did it one a day. And I just watched him build himself mm -hmm. on so many different levels. I admire him on so many different levels. You know, I just never got a chance. I was so young. And uh, like I said, I was in the streets in a, in a way where that you have to probably look at TV for me to explain. Mm. You know, some things I can't just say, but if you look yeah. at power, I'm not lying to you. If you look at power, you will kind of understand, you know, just place me in a movie like Power or New Jack City and just take me and place my character and me in it. And you can kind of understand where it was kind of like, uh, I mean, to get $20,000 for some drugs was easy. That was yeah. simple. That was very simple. That wasn't a hard task, mm. you know, uh, to spend four or five thousand dollars a day on this to eat and make it right back, that was that was it was easy, you know. To so to tell me to go rap, I'm like rap what? <laughs> I just wrapped up seven. I just wrapped up seven eight hundred in two days. What I'm a rap? Rap to who? And just keep in mind, I was selling tapes with Juicy J. So mm -hmm. I might leave Juicy J. It was times I didn't have food to eat. So he would buy me and my girl. He buy him and me and his girlfriend some food to eat. Like. <laughs> You know, at McDonald's, after a while, it kind of got embarrassing because he'll ask her what she wanted to eat. What you want to eat, Noah? And I, <laughs> you know, you got to think I come from, I worked at 14 years old. My mama had me with a job. I worked two jobs in the 10th grade and graduated. Nice. So I'm not really accustomed to, I'm not, I wasn't accustomed to, I, I just wasn't accustomed to somebody else having to take care of me. And it kind of, it kind of deterred me a lot. I was, then I got sprung cocaine. I had nowhere to live. I was living with my auntie. And she was always, she was a gambler and she always looked for money. So she was like, you gotta be, I look like an idiot or a fool to her. She always called me a fool because she said, I would never just rap for nobody for no free, you always doing that. And I live with her. I didn't have no money on no bills. I was always broke and you know, I looked nice and I, I dressed nice and I had a nice name, but you know, I wasn't helping out on no bills and stuff like that. So all that kind of played a part in like why the, the rap just didn't, you know, I could sell a few tapes. That was cool. But, like, it's hard to come back to your neighborhood and you got, they got 20000 on the table and they got 6000 in cocaine in a pile. Mm -hmm. And he's just snowing and they got boxes of shoes and it's just clothes everywhere. And, you know, it was hard to just go back and say, okay, I'm going to rap with Juicy J. Yeah. Because it, 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 it was cool and it was cool on stage, but when in, my, in my public life, it was terrible. It was just terrible. It was like, so when I did, um, when I did finally embrace, like, cause I grew up around, like my family was linked in, into a lot of things. So I didn't have to go across the street or around the corner. I just had to ask a question and, hold, and, and, and stand up to what I said. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I didn't know the ramifications of the game. I didn't know, I didn't know at that young age touching that kind of money. I didn't know, like, touching that kind of money, how what it was possessed with. I lost my first homeboy at 14. Grown guys killed him because he came from Chicago. You know, he really knew that those drugs better than us. And he was ahead of us, and he had to pay bills with his mama, so he matured at a different rate than us. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was like that, 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 that crack really tore us apart. It really tore us apart. Like, it, we, we, we forgot about I, – I forgot about my childhood in the seventh grade, man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I just forgot it. I forgot. No more catch a girl, get a girl, none of that. And and you know, you gotta you gotta you gotta think about it. Like if I if I wanted something to eat, I would send a grown person to go get me something to eat. If I wanted some if I wanted pussy, I would get a grown woman to fuck me. 
it, it, I'm not being funny with you. I'm telling you, that's what drugs mm -hmm. did to us. So how, how could you get me to have a level of respect or a level of understanding when my only level of understanding is this bankroll in my pocket and this dope? Because it's going to do what I say do, and everybody else going to do what I say do. So, like, that wasn't life, but we thought that that was life. Yeah. <laughs> we really thought that that was forever. We thought, like, we never had nothing. We always been broke. Everybody we know fucked up. Now we on top. Like, it, it was the biggest, it was the biggest, biggest, biggest piece of bullshit trick I ever seen in my life. Wow. So did you ever get to the point to where, you know, how they became rich? Did you ever get to that point or you was just, um, no, you know, what, you just had enough money just, because of the I, drugs. Yeah, I basically had to play around with, with um, to just really dove into it real deep. Because once I, the minute I got into it, uh, the, the the minute I got into the dope game, I got a little beside myself, and I started testing drugs with people in the industry. So the stuff that the dudes wouldn't do with me in the streets, niggas in the industry start kind of pulling me into. And once I got pulled into that, it kind of played more of a part. Oh, than, than it did me getting money. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then though it was like I could get money and do this. And that level of arrogance. If, if you ever seen Scarface, you see that you see that level of arrogance when he's at the table with that pile of cocaine with that gun. Fuck you, man. You know that mm -hmm. that level of arrogance. That we all embraced that moment, and we made that moment, and we all made that scene actual factuals, whether we lived or died by it. And that's kind of where I was at. Like I would, I used to tell dudes when they used to look for me because I used to rob them. I used to tell them, if you catch up with me, I'm already a dead man. Make sure you don't get yourself killed. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So it was, it was, that was the way we lived it. It wasn't, it wasn't a, we lived it just like that. Well, you and, know, it, in I mean, Memphis, am I back? Okay. In Memphis, it's kind of like that yeah. anyway. I grew up, uh, well, I moved to Memphis at 19. I stayed there for 16 years and you know, it's kind of like that that life anyway, you know. Even in parts right. of Mississippi and stuff, and folks don't realize that. It's like, look, you come at me, either I'm going to kill you or you're going to kill me. You see what I'm saying? But ain't nobody scared. You know, ain't but, nobody but scared, the difference see? in Mississippi and Memphis is we try to get along. We just don't cross people just because, you know. So right. somebody got to actually do something to the other person. About that, I know about you know the life in Memphis because I was in I you know was bad as I don't know what so I got you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah my first week there I got partners right now that you know we became friends and basically they approached me because I had a scarf on my head and and I wasn't even thinking. I had just moved there like three or four days before and I washed my hair and my aunt asked me to go to the store, you know, to get something for her. And when I was walking, yeah. there, it was like eight or nine guys approached me and said, you got on the wrong color. But me being the person that I was, you know, it wasn't never scared of nobody. I'm like, okay, well the baddest motherfucker take it off then, you know? So, and they became actually friends with me. We still friends right today. You know, because they- See, that's like, what I'm saying. And that's how- Because you ain't scared of nothing. You know, where you- Right, from? right. Exactly. So- And I, um, I, I, I always have liked that about Memphis because as long as you can prove yourself, in time right now, they text me, they- Doing everything at the same. Now people want you to be. Yeah, they now people want you to be what they want you to be. People, people stood behind you when you stood behind self. Now people want to stand. You know, they don't, they individuality and, and, and originality is not attractive 
a manhood is not attractive. Uh, to be a nice looking woman without all, all that shit is not attractive. I never mm -hmm. seen a guy say, I'm gonna go marry her because her eyelashes are pretty. I'm gonna go <laughs> be with her because she has a nice eyebrow. I don't exactly. understand where they go on with it. I'm gonna love her. Like it's just too, to me, it's too much frivolous stuff going on that we pay attention to that I just think if we paid attention more to, uh, like I say, self, because mm -hmm. you can learn. So you, you got all your life to learn yourself. So it, it, it's not like you ain't got nothing to be busy with. <laughs> you understand yeah. what I'm saying? You got your whole life to learn. You know. And what I just did with the music, I, um, I quit. I just decided to be serious with the music because I understand I understand the ramifications of the streets is not the same. You know, you, the money's not there, the, the Lord is not there. Uh, you got the top, the guy that you respect the most might be the police. Uh, it's, it's like, regardless of how high you go, you still got this, 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 how can I put this without saying too much? Regardless of how high you go, it's still another level of anarchy that you have to answer to. And you kind of like, wow, I thought, you know, at the bottom when I moved up, this was going to be like this at the top. It's kind of almost like, People said never meet your your idol because you, mm -hmm. they may not be your idol once you meet them because you have mm -hmm. so much of an expectation for them and then when you meet them they flatten it you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and I ran across there's so much in the streets that I just kind of don't even I don't even pump earn to it no more I just let everybody talk to uh, what 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 they, what the Migos said um they whipping up dope in the kitchen uh they whipping up dope with the Uzi. I'm like, he's, mm -hmm. is he whipping up dope with the Uzi? Like, how is you cooking up dope with the Uzi? Like, did you put the gun down? Did you cook the dope? Did you, <laughs> did you I'm talking about, I'm whipping up dope with the Uzi. Is somebody looking out the window? Who's uh -huh. at the door? Like, who's yeah. up the street with the walkie-talkie? Uh, is What shift was it? The first shift was the first shift with the police on the first shift, second shift, the cunt is coming through. Like, they say all this shit. But they ain't telling you, you, you know, they're not telling you all this other shit. Like, I'm cooking up dope with the Uzi. How are you cooking it up and you got the Uzi in your hand, man? I just be listening to stuff and I'd be like, wow. It's amazing <laughs> what people don't know that they should know. And it's amazing how much they just, how much little that they accept compared to what really goes on. So I try to make sure when I say stuff about, if I say something about a, a, some dope and some Uzi, I'm going to tell you everything that go along with that dope and that ooze, because the ATF going to come to your house if they get, if the dudes get too scared of you in the streets, the ATF coming. Is that? You know, it, it, after the ATF coming, you know, you got, you got, a uh, you got Homeland Security, you know, they try to send you to Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to tell you all of these things in it before you touch it. That way, when you know, when you touch it, you know what you're doing, you kind of got an idea, okay, basically, you shouldn't even fuck with it. That's my whole thing. Yeah, but if you decide to fuck with it, no, this is what's going on. My daddy said I can't give you the world, but I can teach you how to deal with it. So I I treat my fans like that. I can't show my fans everything. I can't give my fans the world, but I can show them how to deal with stuff that caught me. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and it's about you getting kinda, better. Yeah, if you're not if you're not here making about life better, how good is your life? Mhm. Mm like how great is your life if you can't afford to make somebody else's life better? You just this big old great person, but you can't make nobody else life better. Are you exactly? Really great? Exactly. Or are you being a self-proclaimed great person? <laughs> mm, exactly. Exactly. So let me ask you this: Did you ever, at, at the point of you being in the industry, did you ever feel as though, okay, when I make it, I'm going to take care of everybody, and then went through what you went through and decide? Wow, didn't no, wouldn't nobody like, else for me, so why would I? Because I hear a lot of... You know what? Player Fly says something. I'm not a big fan of Player Fly, personally. You know, we, 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 I, would, I would go way back. But he said, he always say things that just, I, I respect them for. He said, they ask me if I blow up, will I forget about them? And I have to ask them if I don't blow up, will you forget about me? Exactly. And I keep that in my mind. It, it keeps me humble, but it keeps me... I guess you could say vigilant at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So I don't, um, I know I can't save the world, but I know I can get me some land and get T-Mobile to build a tower on my land and get me some overalls and a straw hat and plug out. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So I know you were saying that you was coming to the ATL. You moving to the ATL soon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I really want to move to the ATL. The only thing about the ATL I'm worried about is like the music is doing good. I like where things are going. I just don't know if I'm going to a place where it's too crowded for what I have going on. Like that's my only thing. Now, I'm, from my understanding, like it's never too crowded there. It's always mm -hmm. an open lane for you, long as you long as you got gas and you put on it, it's an open exactly. lane. Exactly. So that's exactly. Kind of where I've been at. Well, you know, so I'm pretty sure you down there. I'm pretty sure you'll get me down there, and uh, I'm pretty sure you'll take me to Two Chain and uh, Ti and Kanye. And then when we get down. There. <laughs> Shoot, you probably know them better than me. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> but I do know a few managers and stuff. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that you know them too. You know the um uh, the right. legends and stuff that I have went to their studios and at their personal homes and stuff like that. So. You know, but like I said, I'm sure you know the same people that I know even more, way more. So you're going to yeah. introduce me to some people when you get down. <laughs> yeah, I move real fast. So when we get down, we got to do it real fast. I move, I, I move, sometimes people say I move too fast, but the minute but I, I get down there, well, we're going to do a whole lot real quick. Okay, that's how I like it. That's how I move fast yeah. too. That's that hyper tell. thing. That's the hyper thing in me and stuff. I like the, you know, that's why I be doing something. You know what I call it? Uh, I call it drive. It's just drive. Yeah. I call it drive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when you get down here, you Automatic know. Automatic drive. Exactly. So when you get here, you know, like I said, you know, we're going to put your daughters in some stuff, some movies and have them acting and stuff, modeling. You know, doing different things. Yeah, stuff. I gotta put my daughters on paperwork just in case they decide to quit acting like my daughter. <laughs> hey, for real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just in case you decide to forget you my daughter, sign this little piece of paper right here. That I'm your and manager daddy love and you. your daddy. <laughs> and daddy love you. <laughs> exactly. So there won't be no misunderstandings. I'm your manager so and be your no daddy. No misunderstanding, because I'm looking at the fruit and you're looking at it right now, baby. It's I understand. Exactly. That's the best thing to do, though. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, you always got to keep it in order. Because it's in this industry, what a lot of people don't realize is, like you said, money changes people. You know, so you can start off with a family member or a friend or something, but basically when the money start coming, ain't no telling who's going to be in their ear, you know, and, and what's going to change them. So you got to be careful uh -oh. and, and keep everything in paperwork. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> keep it exactly. all in paperwork. Uh, people forget and paper don't. Exactly. Paper does not forget. People forget. Exactly. Paper won't forget. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so what is it that you want to tell people right now that uh, basically that you want to leave with some type of knowledge that you want to leave with folks? That's, that's trying to do what you have done, the mistakes that you have made that you want to talk about, that you, you know, don't want other artists to get caught up in, you know, Tell us something right now that you can leave with them and get close to the camera and stuff because I want them to see your face. Can you see me? I just see your lips now, your nose and your lips. So, right? Okay. You see me now? Yeah. Oh, okay, listen. If you want to do this, do it. Don't listen to mommy. Don't listen to daddy because my first tape, my mama told me don't do that first tape, but chicks come in the mail and she want to know, mm -hmm. don't let Nobody tell you first and foremost that you can't do it. But know this. Look around and see what you up against. Make sure that when you weigh yourself value-wise, value, not skill, not words, not bragging, not uh, what you think, not what your friends say, make sure your own level of value it's where it need to be before you begin to include people into it. Exactly. Do it on your own, do great at it. But when you begin to pull people into it, make sure you have added value to yourself. 
Whatever you do with this music, add value to yourself, and you will understand why I said that later on. I don't care what level you on, whether it's high or low, always maintain value and add value to yourself, and you'll be good. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, and the other thing, what can you tell people about your mistakes that you want to tell the artists to not do? Don't look at, don't wait on nobody to certify you. Certify yourself. Learn what you're doing. Learn who you need to talk to. Learn what you need to do with your lyrics. Learn BMI. Learn uh, sound exchange. Learn everything um, that people avoid trying to learn. And try to minimize as many steps. Because I don't say mistakes. I don't believe in mistakes. I believe in steps. Mm -hmm. And minimize as many steps uh, as you need to to get you to your destination. It's just, you know, you're going to have to take a couple steps, and some steps you may stumble. But, you know, just try to minimize those and just know just know the area, just know the plight, know the plane. It's just like if I wanted to get a job for Walmart and, and I was at an interview, the first thing I would do, whatever department I want, I would figure out what that department been doing for the past six months and everything wrong that department been doing, I would tell the person that's interviewing me that I know his weaknesses and I can be a strength to that weakness. Mm -hmm. See, now they, now you're, now you're not just someone that needs a job. They need you now. Exactly. Because you let them know I added value to myself by figuring out where you needed me. Exactly. Now, when do I start? Now, when do I start? <laughs> now the interview is not so much like, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say. It's basically like, you know I need a job, and I know you need help. Let's meet in between. Exactly. That's why I said add that small level of value, and you'll be all right. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chico Sanchez, uh, a.k.a. Lenard, <laughs> a better known as Derek Harris. Yes. Thank yeah, my you mama so loved much. it. <laughs> Thank you. My I mama really loved that, that Derek has. She loved it. <laughs> and look, uh, so I know you're going to call in on the radio show and stuff, and I'm going to play some of your music as well. So I really appreciate you being on Living Your Dreams with Rosita. And I will be meeting up with you soon, either if I get to Memphis before you come here, but we're going to link up and. Any closing thing that you want to say? Everybody, go see y'all sure. The Cheese Dope Challenge, because it seems like they share everybody Cheese Dope Challenge but mine. But one thing I'm grateful about, I talk, I talk like Muhammad Ali right now, because that's who I feel like. The people love they champ, and they rooting for me. I thank y'all. I love y'all. I praise y'all. Y'all keep my name pumping. Y'all keep me alive. Even when they try to shit on me, y'all keep a shield on my head. And I promise you, I will never forget that, and I will work hard as I can to show you I respect it, I honor it, and I love what I do, and I love my fans. Make sure y'all go get that Cheese Dope Challenge remix. Listen to it. Check it out. Send it to Project Pat. Send it to Juicy J. Uh, 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 send it to Young Dog. Send it to Key Glock. Just send it to the top four so we can get some more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Now, you have an awesome day, and y'all have been watching Living Your Dreams with Rosita. And Mr. Chico Sanchez, aka Lil Noah from 3 Six Mafia. And y'all, peace and love. Until next time, peace. Peace.